Have you ever felt uneasy staring at a dubious email or answering that oddly suspicious phone call? Well, you're not alone. These type of attacks happen every day to thousands of unsuspecting victims. Today, we're going to dive into the waters of cyber deceit with TCM Security's new free course, Practical Cybersecurity Awareness. My name is Aaron Wilson. I'm a principal security engineer at TCM Security. And together in this first video of four parts that we'll be posting throughout the month of October, we will decode the secrets of phishing, vishing, smishing, and the elusive business email compromise. So when was the last time that you received an email like this? Well, although that email may seem a bit silly, this is a real class of attack that hackers and threat actors are using every day to breach your organizations and your information. Now let's take a second and look through that email again for suspicious indicators that we can use to defend ourselves against an actor like this. So one of the first places you should look whenever you receive an email in your personal or business email inbox is the sender line of that email. If it's coming from someone that you do not recognize, then that can always be a big red flag for any email that you're receiving. For example, here the sender is John Money, and the email address associated with that is john at inheritance.com. Now that at inheritance.com is not necessarily a big red flag in any way. Maybe that is a legitimate domain, maybe it's not. But uh, if, especially if you're a business, this is sometimes where you can find someone doing something malicious, where that email is coming from a domain that is unfamiliar to you, but maybe has the name of your company or has other aspects tied to it that might make it familiar to you. So if you never received an email from someone with this name before, then that could be a cause for suspiciousness and a red flag to you. Okay, so the next part of the email we're going to be looking at is the actual body of the email. And in this case, there are quite a few red flags and misspellings to be looking out for. So for example, here the first uh, highlighted point is that the sender is saying, Dearest Friend. And that means that this email was probably blasted out to a bunch of different people, right? Because they're not addressing you by your name. So uh, they're just adding in a generic uh, word there. Maybe it's like friend, dearest person neighbor, something like that, that would, uh, you know, make you feel like they kind of know you, but they didn't actually use your name, right? So this would be a red flag here. Also going down the first sentence there, my grandfather is misspelled. So always look for common misspellings like that. Uh, a lot of phishing campaigns have gotten a lot more sophisticated to where uh, there will not be that many misspellings, but it can still happen. So it's definitely something to look at uh, in every email that you receive. Here we can see uh, the hook, which is a very wealthy sum of money in excess of $10 million. So they're definitely trying to hook you in there, trying to offer you $10 million, which obviously is a large sum of money to a lot of people. And then they're further justifying this email by saying, although this may seem out of the blue, right? So they're offering you something and then trying to make it seem familiar to you and that's okay that you're receiving this email. This is a common tactic used by threat actors to try to justify their actions and the reason why you are actually receiving this email in the first place. Finally, in this email, they're saying, please kindly give me a call at XXXXXXXX, sincerely, John, right? So here they're trying to make you kind of go out of band from this email address. They want you to call that number, and from there, they're going to use additional tactics try to get you to trust them more and to build that trust up because if you're taking the time to actually call them that means that you definitely believed the email and you're considering actually doing business with them right so these are all the red flags from this email and we'll go look at a new example in uh, a few seconds so as I mentioned these emails that I showed up on the screen are a form of social engineering attack we're we'll covering four different main social engineering attacks today. There are a few more than this, uh, but these are the ones we're just gonna be covering in this video. So the first one is phishing, and this email that was received here is a form of phishing. This is an email which is sent to a victim, it tries to get them either to click a link or to take some actions. The next attack is vishing which is a call or a phone call, right? So you're talking to someone actually over the phone. 
Now, in this example of a phishing attack, the ultimate goal of the attacker is actually to get the victim to call them, right? So this is kind of a combination between phishing and vishing, where once someone goes up and calls that number, they're going to continue to try to get money, try to get access to computers, whatever it is that they want to do. Vishing is a form of a social engineering attack that takes place over voice. Finally, we have smishing which is uh, SMS messaging, so text messaging from your cell phone. You can see the little cell phone icon there. And uh, this is a way of also trying to get an entry point to you, right? So maybe they're impersonating UPS, maybe you're getting a spam text message, maybe you're getting constant spam text messages, right? Uh, this is another way that attackers can try to convince you to click a link, to call them, or to take other actions that can give them your information. And a final one, since we do like talking about businesses, is this idea of business email compromise. So the whole idea here in this social engineering attack is that someone is actually able to get into your business, impersonate that they are an employee either by locking in as them, or somehow uh, exploiting their device, right? And from there, they're able to try to send emails out to other people in the organization. So this actually makes that email come from a, a trusted source within the organ, organization. And this is called a business email compromise, or sometimes you'll see me refer to this as a BEC. Now let's take a second and take a look at another phishing email and see if we can find all the indicators of uh, suspiciousness that we should be looking for. Now that you have a chance to look at that email, let's check out which parts of it are suspicious. Again, the first place to look at for an email would be that header line, right? So uh, in this case, we have account expiration action required. And in this case, we actually have a label on this email that marks it as external. You see that big yellow indicator there? A lot of organizations will implement this type of protection. It's definitely something to be recommended because this will indicate to you that the email originated from outside of your organization. So in this case, that big yellow indicator that says external should be something that we look at and understand that this email, first of all, came from outside of our organization for some reason. The next part of the email to look at, of course, is the sender line. In this case, the sender is login alerts, and it's login dash alert at login loginsalerts-myco.com. It's actually misspelled there in the at loginsalerts-myco.com. If we're imagining ourselves working for a company called Myco, you could, you could think of how legitimate this might seem. But uh, because the domain is loginsalerts-myco.com, this could be a domain that an attacker is actually typo squatting uh, to make it seem legitimate, right? So uh, in this case, the login alert at loginsalerts-myco.com, while it might seem kind of benign, this could be an indicator here as well because it does say logins alerts. And again, that email address is just kind of generic, right? It's not from someone in particular that might work at your company. It's just login alerts. The next part of the email to look at is the body. And in this case, we have a different type of hook that the attacker is trying to use. So here we have your login is expiring immediately. They're trying to make you take an immediate action to go there and click the link, right? So they're trying to really make you do something fast. And this is a spot where you should always stop and think to yourself, oh, why is this person or this email trying to make me do something immediately? So this is a definitely a big red flag in this email because it says your login is expiring immediately. Now in some cases that might make sense, right? Because maybe your password is expiring uh, for your account, but uh, in other cases maybe your password's not expiring, right? So always think to yourself, why am I getting this notification? When is it coming? Does it actually make sense in the timeline of when I need to take actions with my account? Finally, here in the bottom section there, it says, thank you, my account administration, or my co-account administration, right? So this could be another big red flag for you as well, especially if you're in an organization, because maybe you know that the security team does not call themselves account administration, right? So this is something to think about when you're receiving emails, 
does the sender actually make sense? Because this could be an easy spot for an adversary to make a mistake where they say it's from account administration, but maybe the security team is actually called identity access management or the IT help desk or something like that, right? So you always wanna look for that type of indicator as well, where maybe the attacker does not 100% know the organization and made a small mistake there. And the final part of the email to look at for suspiciousness is any links or additional things to call, right? So in this case, this link would lead us to auth.loginsalerts-myco.com. Sometimes that link will be totally different than the sender of the email address. I would not necessarily recommend hovering over the link. I think at this point we have enough evidence to actually report this email as spam. But if you do hover over the link, you can usually see where that will actually send you to, right? And also in Gmail, if you click the triple dot icon up there in the top right, you can actually view the email as original or as HTML, which will allow you to inspect the uh, email contents, right? So in this case, the attacker is trying to get you to click this link to validate your account, which would lead you to a landing portal there that probably also looks legitimate, like something your company would have. Um, and that's how they're doing it, right? They're trying to make you go to auth.loginsalerts-myco.com. Don't even think about it, right? Your login's expiring, you're out to take action right now. So always take a moment and think about that. If you have the opportunity, also make sure you're checking out those URLs as well because that can be an indicator as well. If they want you to go click something, they want you to go log in to say your Gmail account, your Microsoft account. One of the best strategies I like to implement is always to just go open a separate web browser window and just navigate to that website myself and don't click any links, right? So if they're telling you to go log in to this portal or that portal and to follow this link or that link, you should always go to the portal manually as opposed to clicking the link. All right, so let's talk about a different type of social engineering attack, and that is vishing. And vishing is a form of social engineering that takes place over the phone. This can often be in the case of a phone call or maybe in the case of that first phishing email we took a look at right once you read that email you call up a number and that's when the uh, additional scam takes place right so the phone calls might be constant maybe they call you once a day at a specific time or multiple times a day or it might be even a one-time call one of my uh, actual personal experiences with vishing was that one time I received a phone call from a number that I did not recognize. And when I answered the phone, I said, hello. And they said, this is the FBI. Have you ever lived at this location, lived at that location? They started asking me a bunch of different questions to try to gather some information about me. And they said they were like investigating me for some type of crime, right? Well, as this phone call was actually taking place, I did some research on that phone number. And actually what these scammers were doing was actually impersonating or spoofing the phone number of an actual FBI field office that was in the state in which I was living. Now, that is something that is actually quite scary, right? Because if you're not aware of these type of attacks, then you could definitely fall for that and believe them. So what I really started to do to try to come back in that scenario is start asking them questions back. Like, why are you calling me? What am I being investigated for? How can you prove to me that you are the FBI, right? And once I started actually asking some of those questions, they really started to get upset with me. So at that point, uh, I knew definitely for sure this was not any type of legitimate phone call. So once you start questioning a lot of the things that these scammers might be trying to do by calling you, they're going to start getting upset or maybe they'll even hang up. And that can really indicate to you that the phone call is suspicious. Now, another form of vishing these days is when an attacker might call an IT help desk. And uh, what these... Uh, attackers will actually do is go out onto sources uh, and look for phone numbers of people who work at the company and they'll try to spoof that phone number so the help desk thinks that the phone number and phone call is legitimate right from there maybe they'll try to reset the password of accounts or try to get into systems and say hey my computer is broken right so if you work on a high IT help desk you always need to be aware of these type of attacks because attackers can try to spoof numbers a lot of people leave their phone numbers out uh, 
in the open on social media so people can go out and try to spoof those phone numbers and see if they can get in past your defenses. So even if you work in IT, a help desk, something like that, you always want to be aware of phone calls that you're answering as well and build a system within the help desk right, to be able to try to uh, prevent those types of attacks. Maybe you can start documenting some common words and verbiage that those attackers say, right? Again, talking over the phone with someone will often build trust. And so in that first example of the phishing email, you read the email and then you call a number. It builds the trust that, hey, you're talking to someone legitimate and that this offer is legitimate, right? So always be aware that if you're talking to someone, they're really trying to build up that trust with you. That might be a, a red flag for you, right? Because you shouldn't be really building trust with someone that you need to know. If someone's calling you from the bank, for example, they're really trying to butter you up and say, oh, you're one of our best clients, stuff like that. Maybe uh, that is not in your best interest, right? And you need to go verify with your bank somewhere else because they're trying to convince you to give them something that they should not have. The next form of social engineering, again, is smishing. And smishing is a form of social engineering that takes place also over the phone, like vishing, right? But instead, it is via text message or messaging services. And by messaging services, I kind of mean things like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, all these other types of text messaging services as well. I know a lot of people use other types of messaging apps like Telegram and WhatsApp and uh, Facebook messaging. So I wanted to kind of uh, book those in here with the smishing attacks as well. Now, these text messages, again, may be constant, like a spam that's coming in every day, every hour from different numbers with similar types of wording, or even just a one-time text message, right? So for me personally, one of these text messages that I got that I was really not uh, even uh, really sure about was someone just texted me and said, hey, how are you doing? Uh, how did those pictures go or something like that, right? Now, if I actually replied back to that uh, text message to say like, hey, who are you? They could possibly use that as a little uh, hook for me, right? If I said, hey, who who are you? Who's this phone number? I don't know you. What are you talking about with the pictures, right? That's when they can actually use that against you and try to say, oh, maybe I'm your friend over here, right? Or I'm uh, your coworker from over here. And uh, once, once you start uh, corresponding with this person more, maybe they'll try to actually get you to do something at that point, right? So they're often, with well, these text messaging attacks, they're just trying to see if you will respond at all to further target you. So if you uh, respond back to that text message, then they're going to do more research. They see you as a juicier target. They're going to try to build that trust up a little bit more, right? So maybe if I replied to that text message, they would say, oh, hey, I'm your friend, Jim over here. And uh, you remember those pictures we took three years ago, right? They were great times, right? Trying to build up that trust and uh, make you think that they're legitimate. And then once you save that person in your contacts, right, then it becomes even harder because you think that you already trust that person as who they told you that they are. And a big vector here, definitely too as well, is scammers on dating websites and things like that. So, for example, maybe you've been talking to someone on a dating website for quite some time and you really, maybe you're running out of time on the dating website or you just want to talk to them a bit more. So, you know, you give them your phone number and you start texting back and forth and that is really how the scamming kind of starts. Once they get that, that phone number, then they know they have the trust to be able to text you and then from that point on, maybe a few weeks later, they're going to start feeling comfortable to call you and then from that point on, they're going to start feeling to comfortable to ask you to do things for them like sending them money. So eventually it's kind of like a long haul scam, right? Where they started on a dating website, now they're inside your text messages, now they're inside your head and now they're getting you to do things and give them things that otherwise you would never trust a normal person with, right? Okay, so let's now talk about business email compromise. Business email compromise is the same thing as phishing, except this occurs from within your organization. So the email will appear legitimate and come from an insider. So a threat actor actually has to exploit someone before this attack happens. And so they'll often uh, compromise someone who might be an executive, maybe the IT help desk, or other trusted employees within the organization. And now what they're going to do with this type of attack is send an email from that compromised account. So maybe uh, 
an executive gets compromised and they're sending something to their executive assistant to help them uh, do something. And there's already that trust relationship there, right? And one story that I can really think about that happened in my career is that a high-level employee actually got compromised and they sent emails to their executive assistant to buy them a bunch of Google Play gift cards. And the assistant actually went out and did that, went out to the store, bought tons of gift cards, brought them back, and gave the attacker all the codes. So they pretty much got a lot of money uh, from these gift cards that they were requesting from their employee. But the thing to keep in mind about Beck, about business email compromise, is that it's always going to have one big red flag. And that is that the attacker needs you to do something immediately. Maybe it's going to buy a gift card. Maybe it's asking you to open an attachment or review a document. Maybe they're saying, hey, can you review this by end of day today? Uh, maybe they're trying to get you to click a link to fix something, right? They're trying to use your trust relationship with this person to get you to go do something that might seem normal, but is actually malicious at the end of the day. So if someone is coming to you, through your email or whatever means of communication your company uses, always question it if it's something immediate, right? Like if they need something, I need it done in the next five minutes, something like that, right? Always ask questions and also always feel free to reach out to that person out of band of the original communication method, right? Because uh, if you reach out to them out of band, maybe you call them instead of answering the uh email maybe you text them instead of answering the email maybe if they're hitting you up on teams or slack or whatever maybe you're going to call them or email them instead right because uh you're able to go in and validate that that account is legitimate and the request is legitimate right so if you ever have a doubt about something in your workplace where you think oh it's really weird that this person's sending me this and asking me to do this then always ask questions and seek to clarify before you do something, right? Because little do you know, you might be falling into a trap of a business email compromise if their email was actually compromised. Okay, so now let's talk about some phishing defenses for personal use. Well, use your email providers report spam features, right? Almost every email provider that exists for normal users like you and I uh, has a report spam feature. You should use that because it's going to help them to crack down on email addresses where these spams or spam messages are actually originating from, right? Never click a link in an email telling you about an alert update or new feature. You should always go to those websites directly or via search engine. And this is definitely something that attackers will use to try to trick you. They'll say like, oh, hey, your bill is due at this time. They'll say, Maybe your electrical company, your bill is overdue. We need you to go pay it. So what I always do in my personal life is that I try never to click a link in an email telling me about an alert. Even if I know it came from a legitimate email address that I've seen many times in the past, I'll always go to the website directly instead of going to my bank uh, via the link. I'll go to the bank via uh, a web browser, right, instead of clicking that link. Or maybe I'll go and search for my bank's name on the search engine and use that instead of clicking the link. So always go out of band of that email address when you're talking about something like an alert update or new feature. And finally, of course, never open attachments or documents from people that you don't trust and that you don't know. And also be wary of that because even normal people's email addresses can be compromised, right? So always... Uh, Keep an awareness around that and try to think before you click anything that came from anyone you trust or anyone that you don't trust. Now, vishing and smishing defenses for personal use. Well, you should always use your phone provider's block and report functionality. You should have the ability to block phone calls with whatever phone you're using, uh, whether it's an Android or an iOS, that is a built-in functionality of all phones these days, at least smartphones. Uh, so you can use the block and report functionality of your phone provider. You can also use third-party apps like Haya, RoboKiller, etc. There's tons of different apps out there that can help to reduce spam calls and also uh, spam text messages. If you're in the U.S., join the National Do Not Call Registry at do not call gov. You can go on there and sign up. You will need to provide them an email address at the very least. You can actually add your phone number to... 
uh, their do not call list. And that actually helps to improve, believe it or not, the amount of calls that you get if you're getting calls all the time. Uh, don't answer the phone or text messages for numbers you don't recognize. If someone is legitimate, right, if it's a business really trying to contact you, more than likely they're going to leave a voicemail and they're going to explain the situation and why you need to call them back and provide you a callback number, right? So don't answer the phone for text messages or phone calls from numbers you don't recognize because a lot of times if they're just a scammer or a spammer, they're going to not leave any type of message at all they're just going to try to call you back later because they don't have time to waste uh leaving voicemails up for every one of their victims right so just don't answer the phone for those numbers you don't recognize and finally always ask questions if it seems to be your bank or other authorities calling you just in like in my example from previously where i talked about someone from the fbi supposedly tried to call me and convince me that they were an authority Always ask questions if it's like your bank calling you, you're some type of an authority, anyone who might have any type of authority over your life or your decision making, always ask questions if some call is coming to you out of the blue. Now, phishing defenses for business. One thing that we always recommend for uh, phishing defenses for business, you want to implement a report fish or spam button for your users. This just makes it easy and convenient for your end users to actually go out and report uh, issues with emails, right? So implement a report fish button so people know exactly and training to go along with that, right? So people know exactly what to do when they see an email that might be suspicious. Use email filtering technology to reduce spam. Of course, there's tons of vendors out there in the security world that can help you with this uh, in terms of email filtering. And there's even things uh, with like Office 365, for example, where there's some built-in uh, email filtering technology already as part of the product. Next, add an external email tag to all email originating from outside your organization. Again, we talked about this before with one of the phishing examples where they had an external email tag. That is going to help your users, help them identify emails that came from outside the organization at the end of the day, right? So you want to add that external email tag to all email originating from outside your organization. A lot of people, they think that's really annoying labeling all the emails but it is good for user awareness at a basic level, right? You need to have a tag on there so people know when emails are coming from outside versus inside the organization. And finally, implement a domain level firewall to block domains less than 30 days old or with unsatisfactory content. So if you use a uh, tool such as OpenDNS, for example, you can actually use that on your home network. Uh, you can implement a domain level firewall that's going to block domains less than 30 days old. It's going to help to reduce the uh, the risk of a user clicking a link and getting to some domain that's less than 30 days old where uh, the attacker is trying to get people to go there. And uh, finally, you can also implement that on your home router as well. So if you look up things like uh, open DNS and domain level firewalls, uh, on whatever type of router brand you have, you can actually implement that for your home network if you're interested in that. Thank you very much for watching this video. This is the first in a series of videos for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Hope you enjoyed and we'll see you in the next one.